them uh, in a manual fashion. Uh, last week, I talked about toolboxes, uh, specifically about the toolbox of prayer uh, that we all enjoy as believers. I talked about how a hammer does what a hammer does, and a wrench does what a wrench does, a screwdriver does what a screwdriver does, and so too, there are different kinds of prayers. And each one uh, does something very specific. And as I mentioned last week, God will meet you where you're at. Maybe this whole thing's new to you, you don't know anything about prayer or anything about what God's word goes on to say. And so he hears the petitions of his people. The word says that all who call upon the Lord shall be saved. You're in a jam, you need saved, call upon the Lord, he'll save you. But as we grow, God is looking for us to, to come to a greater understanding of him and of his nature. And so regardless of the type of uh, prayer that we use, there are some things that we want to come to the Lord with. And it's Praise Sunday or Palm Sunday today. And we're going to talk about praise. But there are three activities of the human spirit uh, that are universal. And those three things, and I'd encourage you to write these down and others that we share today so that you can not only hear them, that as we go into the Word, you'll not only see them, but that as you write them, they'll reinforce uh, what we're sharing today so it'll take root in your spirit. So those three activities of the human spirit are thanksgiving, worship, and praise. And each one of these three activities enables us to relate to different elements or aspects of God's nature. And we're going to look at those very closely. Because by thanksgiving, what are we essentially doing? Well, we're acknowledging God's goodness. When we bring thanksgiving to God, when we thank him, we're acknowledging and thanking him for everything that he's done for us, all that has come our way, deserved or undeserved. And by worship, we're doing something else. We're acknowledging God's holiness, his majesty, the immense thought, belief, and idea that the creator of the universe loved us so much that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ. That whosoever would believe on him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And, and by worship, what we're essentially doing is we're acknowledging by way of our response uh, his awe-inspiring majesty. And then finally, and appropriate for today, there's this element of God's nature uh, and praise where we acknowledge God's greatness. We acknowledge his greatness and we do that in a way that comes from the heart, but frankly, as we'll see in God's word, uh, emanates from our mouths, from our hands uplifted, from instruments that we sometimes pray, and probably and most importantly at all, the way that we live shows the praise that we have for God. And so we want to keep these three things, thanksgiving, worship, and praise, we want to keep these three big postures in mind as we learn to approach the Lord when we pray. We want to keep those at the forefront of our relationship with him because all too often our prayers are like shopping lists of things that we need, things that we got to have, things that we need God to do, things that we need healed. And you know what? He's our provider. He does all of those things. And that is, that is absolutely awesome. But how would you feel as a parent? I'm, I've got five children. I've got 13 grandchildren. How would you feel as a parent if all your kid did was ask and 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 ask? Almost got in trouble last week with that word, didn't I, Heather? Ask. So uh, you got to watch that from last week if you want to see how close to the cutting edge I was with that word. But, you know, and the kid never acknowledges or thanks you or appreciates, you know, uh, that that stuff that you just provided for them didn't come out of thin air, that it actually had an origin. And so uh, when we approach the Lord, we want to do something. And this is going to revolutionize your, your life of prayer. We want to come to the Lord with thanksgiving. We want to come to the Lord with thanksgiving in advance. We want to come in, uh, we want to come to him in thanksgiving for his goodness. Amen. We want to come to him for our salvation. We want to thank him for all he does for us. And we want to do that before we ask for anything. So we begin our times of prayer, whether we're home, in the car, at work, whether we're doing it quietly or out loud, take the time to thank God for who he is. Amen. We shouldn't take it for granted. 
Psalm 100, verse 4, you'll see it on the board, it's available on the app, says this, it says that we are to enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise, that we're to be thankful to him and we're to bless his name. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. So again, today is Palm Sunday. Many people, they refer to it as Praise Sunday. And in light of what I've already said about acknowledging God's greatness, look at what it goes on to say in in Psalm 48, verse 1. It says, Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. In the city of our God, his holy mountain. Church, basically what this is saying is that our acknowledgement of God's greatness is by praising him greatly. You see where this is absolutely different from just going to God with your list? God, I need you to hear me. Listen to me. So we want to praise him greatly. And and otherwise, what does that mean? Our praise should be in proportion to his greatness. And that means that our praise should be immeasurable. Because his greatness is immeasurable. His goodness is everlasting. How how much praise should there be? Constant praise, amen? It should be constant as we come to the Lord. That is really the first step of prayer as we approach God. Now, praise uh, after this Thanksgiving is, is like the second stage. And after we've been through our time of Thanksgiving... We pass on to praise. And I want to tell you something, that both thanksgiving and praise, they have both a psychological and a spiritual effect on us as believers. Because if, if we're coming to God with, with petitions that are very great and that they're very difficult, the more that we thank God for what he has already done in our lives, the, more position, the better position we're going to find ourselves in ready, willing, and able to accept the next answer to prayer that we bring. So it's very important to acknowledge God because if we don't come with thanksgiving, then we don't have any buildup to our faith. We don't have anything other than I'm going to take another shot and throw a little more spaghetti on the wall and I'm going to see if it sticks. The sallow, Italian thing, he knows about spaghetti and throwing it on the wall. Let's, let's look at Psalm 100 again and those two verses, verse 4 and 5. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good, everybody say good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. So uh, it's not by any means, church, tiresome to repeat these three things, these three unchanging reasons for thanking and praising God. For the Lord is good, his love is everlasting, and his faithfulness is continuing through all generations. Now, regardless of what version of the Bible you have, one way, shape, or form, that's what it says there. In fact, I want us all to break this down. I'm going to say say these three things. After I say one, I want you all to repeat it out loud because it should be the confession of our mouths. I want you to say this. Say, the Lord is good. good. Say, "His his love is everlasting. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Church, God is always good. His love is everlasting. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Church, that's good news. And now there's another beautiful picture that I want to point out from the book of Isaiah. And if you've got your Bible or you're scrolling, look for Isaiah in chapter 60. Because this is one of the most amazing passages that we have in the latter chapters of the book of Isaiah. And and this is a description of the city of God. That city which, because of our salvation you and I have access to by the blood of Jesus. And and it gives a very, very beautiful picture here in Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 18. Look at it with me, if you would. It said, Violence shall no longer be heard in your land, neither wasting nor destruction within your borders. Church, we can come to a place in the presence of God, literally where violence and destruction are just 
faint echoes from a distance, but they have no reality because of the presence of God in our lives. And how do we get there? Well, look at verse 18. It says, but you shall call your walls salvation and your gates praise. Church, the wall that surrounds the presence of God is salvation. That's the wall. But all the gates have one title, and it's praise. Everybody say praise. In other words, if you want to get through the wall, then you have to get the gate. You have to go through that gate, amen? And that gate is praise. So if there's no praise, can't get through a gate. If there's no praise, everybody say no praise. If there's no praise, there's no access. Well, I got to get to God. I got to get the presence of God. You got to get through the gate. And all the gates of the city are called praise. It, the, the gates to the city aren't called complaining. They aren't called moaning. It's not called groaning. It's not called lamenting. It's not talking about your spouse. It's not talking about your children. It's not talking about your boss. The gates to the city our praise, and it is the only way that we can get into the immediate presence of God, is praise. Amen? And this morning, I want to take the time uh, that we have to look at several more references to this, because we have God's Word to guide us and to lead us, and to show us the way. So first of all, turn to uh, Psalm 22, Psalm 22, verse 3. And we're going to see some words that are, that are addressed to the Lord. Ah. Everybody go ahead. Have a drink of your water right now. <laughs> In the words of Adam Sandler, some high quality H2O. <laughs> Actually, he said it with a different kind of pitch to his voice. This is high quality. Did you find Psalm 22.3? Look what it says, but you. Who's you? It's, we're not talking about a sheep. Um, this, this Hebrew word that's translated and thrown in Hebrew is the word yasab. Yasab. And it literally means to sit on. Everybody say to sit on. It means to sit on. And it also is a word that's used in everyday Hebrew uh, that means to dwell. Uh, if you were to speak Hebrew, and I don't speak Hebrew fluently at all, uh, but if you were to speak Hebrew and you were to make a reference to where you live, you would say that you yasab in Jerusalem. And I don't know how you say the front part of that, but it basically means I sit in or I sit on or I dwell in Jerusalem. And so when you see that word, and although it's perfectly correct to say you are holy who dwell in the praises of Israel, it also means you who sit upon the praises does God sit on? I heard it, Anna, you said it. Amen. A throne. A throne. And that's why it's perfectly correct for the editors of the New King James Version to have written that you are holy who are enthroned on the praises of Israel. And there was a song when I was a relatively new Christian uh, that uh, had lyrics that went something like this. We're building, I'm not going to sing it, I'll just say it. We're building a throne for him to come and take his place amongst them. And, and he's very gracious. He's not demanding God will come amongst us if we don't offer the throne. But we won't recognize God's kingship until we give him the throne of our praise. The throne of our praise. You know, there shouldn't be anybody, unless you can't speak, not praising God during worship and praise at the beginning of service. Shouldn't be anybody not waking up and saying, well, that's not what I do. <laughs> you aren't following the Bible. Because the way to access God and his presence is to praise him. It isn't about whether you can make American Idol or not. I can assure you that everybody sitting around me knows that when I sing. I'm not doing it for you. <laughs> I'm doing it to enter his presence, amen? I'm doing it to enter his presence. So it's appropriate and we, again, won't recognize his kingship until we give him the throne of praise. So from now on, church, whenever you and I come together, whenever we gather here on a Sunday morning and we begin to praise God, whether it's here together or whether it's starting off your morning, I told you many times, I love waking up. I'm very pleased when my eyes open up in the morning. 
and I realize that I'm alive. And the first thing that comes out of my mouth is, praise God, I got another bite at the apple here. Thank you, Jesus. You know, so it's, it's very appropriate for them that he might be seated on there. Uh, and so one of the days provides the appropriate throne from which then we are now able to go into his presence because the gates are praise, right? Go into his presence so that we can then be in a position to apply his word to the situations, the challenges. I want to just mention this, that the word psalms in the Hebrew is the word telehim. And this word telehim basically means praises. Now, I don't know if you realize it or not, but the book of Psalms really is the longest book in the Bible, which means the greatest emphasis in all of Scripture is on praise. I don't praise. I don't open my mouth. I don't sing. (laughs) Again, if that is your answer, then what I will say to you is you have so much opportunity. You have so much potential. If you've been okay with your walk of God, or it's not been that great, or it's even been good, and you haven't been praising, I want to invite you to enter his courts with praise, because it will be amazing once you enthrone him in the proper, in the proper time. And if you find that it's difficult to praise God, then I would recommend that you do what I found to be so helpful in my life, which is to read psalms every day. Read, read a psalm or two every day. It'll bless you. You'll see what I'm talking about, and you'll experience that. And, and basically, everything that we've just seen here, the, all the psalms are basically a prayer and a praise that were given by the Holy Spirit through the psalmist. And, and I believe, again, that if you'll incorporate that into your life, you'll see your prayers go to a whole nother level. Look at what the psalmist says here in 106, verse 47. He says, Save us, O Lord our God, and gather us from among the Gentiles to give thanks to your holy name, to triumph in your praise. Now, notice again these words. Uh, Notice again the same order. There's thanks, or we said earlier, thanksgiving, and there's praise. So when we praise God, we triumph. Now, if you've watched, um, what was that uh, movie with Russell Crowe, the Roman thing, uh, where he was like the Roman Gladiator. gladiator? You know, great, best movie, Pastor Joseph says. You know, a, a triumph in the ancient world, especially as it relates to the, to the Roman world, a triumph was not the winning of the victory. The triumph was the celebration afterwards, after the victory had already been won. So really, in effect, when we really praise God, we're not asking him for the victory. We're praising him for what he's already done. That's called faith, church. It's faith and understanding and belief. We're celebrating the fact that the victory has already been won, and we join him. How many people like to be joined to Jesus? We join Jesus in his triumph. And that's why the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 2.14 said, Thanks be to God who always leads us in his triumph in Christ Jesus. Thanks be to God. He always leads us in triumph. So you see, a triumph or a triumphal procession, it's a celebration of victory in which the general was led through the streets of Rome and the people were on the sidewalks. They were standing on the streets as this guy came down there with a chariot led by a big white horse and everybody began to praise him. And if you watch that movie as we were just referring to, Gladiator, which gives a great picture of a triumphal parade, they'll have the spoils of the victory dragged behind them. Uh, The the conquered king of the Goths and and the others, the barbarians that were behind him, they're in chains behind him. And that is the picture, church, that we want to get a hold of because I want to ask you the question. In In that triumphal procession, where are we? Where are we standing? Well, I will tell you something. We're not being led by chains behind him. We're not even on the streets or the sidewalks waving and praising. Church, when you're in Jesus Christ, you're in the chariot. You're in the chariot. And that's why we can have confidence that he leads us always in triumph. And and how do we get into the chariot, church? By praising him. 
We get into the chariot by praising him. That's the way that we step up into the chariot. And then again in Psalm 30, and it's a significant church how many of these passages are taken from the Psalms. Look at Psalm 30, verses 11 and 12. You know, uh, if you're a part of our church family, you know this. Uh, and if you're not, you're going to hear it. Uh, my, my blessed wife, Dawn, went to heaven a year ago last Thursday, a couple days ago. A year ago Thursday. And uh, as I say, it's been the hardest year of my life the most difficult year of my life, the most painful year of my life. But I want to tell you something. Psalm 30, verse 11 is true. You've turned for me my mourning into dancing. You've put off my sackcloth and you've clothed me with gladness. Now, verse 12 gives us the purpose. To the end that my glory may sing praises to you and not be silent. O oh Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Amen. Notice something, church. Notice that when God takes off the sackcloth and delivers us from mourning, that he does it for a purpose. Yeah. He does it for a purpose. To that end, that my glory may give praise to him. Now I want to take you a little step deeper here. What is our glory? What is our glory? Now I don't want you to speculate. Here because I'm going to give you the answer right from scripture, all right? It's very important because we've got to put two scriptural passages together. Look at Psalm 16, verse 9. This is where the psalmist says this. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. There it is again, my glory. Now, a lot of different versions will translate this differently, but in Acts chapter 2 and verse 26, the apostle Peter, who is inspired by the Holy Spirit, really quotes Psalm 16:9, but he interprets the word glory. So if you have that, take a look at Acts 2, 26. This is the apostle Peter. Therefore, my heart rejoiced and my what? Tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh will also rest in hope. Church, so what is your glory? It's your tongue. Your glory is your tongue. And you want to know why it's your glory? You want to know why God gave you a tongue? To praise him. To praise him. That's right. It's the supreme member of our being from which we can give glory to God. In a certain sense, and this is very true, in a very real sense, if that was the purpose of our tongue, that if you're using your tongue and your words for any other purpose at all, you're misusing what God has given you. It's real quiet in this Presbyterian church. <laughs> We're not Presbyterian, by the way. No. Uh, just they tend to possibly be a little quieter. What are you using your tongue for? What's coming out of your mouth? What is it building up? What is edifying? What is it glorifying? If it's for any purpose other than bringing glory to God, then I would say it's been misused because he has put that tongue in my mouth. He has put that tongue in your mouths to glorify him. And it's to your glory when you use it to bring him glory. Amen? Now turn to Isaiah 61, verse 3. told you we'd have a lot of scriptures here today. I warned Brother Mark in the sound booth today. I said, I'm back. Lots and lots of verses today that he had to program into the, into the computer today. Amen? So Isaiah 61, 30. Now this is also a message for those of you that maybe like me have found yourself in a place of mourning or dealing with depression or anxiety or other things. Uh, and, and it's through this verse that many people have been delivered from anxiety, have been delivered from mourning, have been delivered from depression. Look what it says, Isaiah 61, 3. To console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified to console those who mourn in Zion to give them beauty 
for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Church, you may find yourself in this position now or at some time, but God wants to deliver you from the spirit of heaviness. He wants to deliver you from the spirit of depression, the spirit of anxiety. So I want to challenge all of us. If we don't want to be depressed, if we don't want to be anxious, if we don't want to, and I will tell you, I am in a period of mourning, but I don't live mourning. I'm learning to navigate it all, and the only thing that gets me through is my Jesus and praising his holy name. And I am, and I've told many people this, I want to pinch myself sometimes because I am so amazed at how in the midst of despair and pain, he can bring me such joy. And it happens when I focus on him, not on my stuff. We have a whole cottage industry. It's not even a cottage industry. It's big business now, focusing on our stuff, whatever it is. You do need to identify your stuff so you can call it out, so you can apply God's word to it. But if you want to be a perpetual victim, don't praise. But if you don't, begin to praise God. And we'll talk a little bit more about how we do that when we don't feel like it, because I got news for you. You don't feel like it a lot of times. Amen. You don't feel like it a lot of times. So if you're tempted to be depressed or moody or unhappy, then I want to dare you to put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, not a blanket over our heads. And I've put a blanket over my head before. I've cried till there were no more tears. It didn't help me. It put me to sleep sometimes, but it didn't help me. In Psalm 33, verse 1, the psalmist says, Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, for praise from the upright is beautiful. It's a beautiful garment of your spirit. And then in Jeremiah 33, 11, it says, and we have another aspect of praise and thanksgiving because it's speaking here in Jeremiah 33, 11 about the restoration of God's people. And it speaks about what kind of noise is going to be heard in the streets of Jerusalem. Verse 11, the voice of joy and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the voice of those who will say, praise the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good. For his mercy endures forever. And of those who will bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. For I will will cause the captives of the land to return as at the first, says the Lord. Now I want you to notice, we've seen right in the scripture, two of the three reasons that I spoke of earlier. and, And of those who will bring what? Sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. You might have a version that says the sacrifice of thanksgiving. I want to tell you something. It's important to understand that praise is a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice. It costs you something. It's not always easy. I'll praise the Lord when I feel like it. You'll never feel like it until you do it. Then you'll feel like continuing. You bring it as a sacrifice. And the time that's most important to praise the Lord is when you feel least desirous of doing it. Church, that's the time. Hallelujah. It's the word of God that tells us what to do. In fact, it even tells us here to go absolutely contrary to our feelings. Amen? And Hebrews 13, verse 15 and 16 brings this out. Therefore, by him... By who? Jesus. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, given thanks to his name. Church, how much should we praise God and how often should we do it? Continually, all the time. Good times, bad times, hot times, cold times. We're to do it continually. But look at verse 16. But do not forget to do good and to share. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. So again, praise and thanksgiving is linked directly to sacrifice. And, and I'll tell you, it is absolutely it's incredible because it's the most, praise is the most acceptable to God when it costs us much. I'll let you think about that for a second. 
when it costs us much, not when it's convenient, not when we got all kinds of time, not while we gin up the feelings to go along with the word, when it costs you something, when it's painful, when you're crying, when you're in despair, when you're hurting, when you're in need, when your family is suffering, when finances aren't looking good, that is the time to bring the sacrifice of praise. Otherwise, it just say bring praise. It doesn't say just bring praise because it's praise time. It says bring the sacrifice of praise. When everything else in a situation seems to be against us, church, this is the time to praise the Lord the most in faith, a sacrifice. And then Psalm chapter 8 and verse 2. We learned that praise is a spiritual weapon. This is one of my favorite scriptures. And I like, because I read Psalms and Proverbs every day, I get, I don't, I'm going to get through the Proverbs quickly. I don't get through the Psalms as quickly because there's so many more of them. But I love this one because I feel like this at times. Out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants, you've got to really pay attention. This is a powerful verse. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength because of your enemies that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. Church, God has enemies. It's important to know that. And he has one particular enemy, and he's called here the enemy, and he's called the avenger. Who's that? Satan. And he says here in this verse that there is a way to silence Satan. How many people like to silence Satan in their lives, in their finances, in their, in their stuff? And again, it says that you may silence the enemy. You can silence the devil and, and basically say, shut up. And how does God do that? How does he shut up the mouth of the enemy? Well, when you praise God. When you praise God. When you praise God, you shut up the mouth of the enemy. Uh, you see, because we just saw it here, your praises, they silence the devil. And, and why do we need to silence the devil? Well, what is he doing all the time? He's accusing us. He's deceiving us. He's discouraging us. And you say to God, well, why don't you, why don't you silence the devil? Well, this scripture tells us that it's my job. It's your job. It's your job to silence the devil. Is it your doctors? Is it your spouses? Is it your sisters or your brothers? It's not even God's job. It's your job because he said, basically he said, I've given you the weapon to do it. He says, in Psalm 2, it says, you've ordained strength. God has ordained strength in the life of the believer. He's, in, he's inspired you with strength. And now we know that we know that the New Testament is really a commentary or a, uh, an expansion of what we learn in the Old Testament. In Matthew chapter 21, in verse 15 and 16, uh, this, this little scene was taking place in the last week of Jesus' ministry on the earth. But in verse 15 it said, But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. They were going crazy. In verse 16, it began to say, did you hear what they are saying? And Jesus said something to them. And now he's quoting back from the Old Testament. He's quoting from Psalm 8, verse 2. Listen to what, he's, listen to what he says. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have perfected praise. So where the psalmist said in Psalm number 8, in verse 2, you have ordained strength, Jesus said, you have perfected praise. And we're going to ask ourselves a question. What does that tell us? That the ordained strength of God is perfect praise. That's where the strength of God is. And it doesn't matter how strong or how weak you are because the weapon of praise is irresistible. So irresistible that even babies and infants, as an extreme example, could use it. It may describe where we are when we first come to Christ or we've been in Christ in a while and we've not taken the time to go deeper. We may be spiritual babes still. But even with a lack of knowledge, the knowledge of praising the Lord will stop the devil in your life. Yes. Amen? Amen? So the psalmist chooses the example of the weakest thing we can imagine, nursing babies, uh, nursing infants. And he says, when we praise God, 
Or even when they praise God, they silence the voice of the enemy. All the lies, all the deception, all of the things that he would try to put on us in our minds and, and, on, our, and on our bodies. And to me, it's just amazing to know that we can silence the devil. Yeah. That we can silence the devil. And then uh, again, here's uh, an, another in this list of scriptural things I've been sharing. That the power of praise prepares us. The power of praise prepares the way for God's supernatural intervention in our lives. It opens the door. So let's look, if we could, at Psalm 50. And by the way, uh, are you noticing how many times we're going through the book of Psalms here? Yeah. I'm telling you, the book of Psalms is amazing and one that I would encourage every believer to jump into on a daily basis. Psalm 50, verse 23. Listen to what it says. Whoever offers praise glorifies me. And to him who orders his conduct aright, I will show the salvation of God. Now, if you're looking at the New King James Version, you're going to see this word aright is in an italics. And it's put in italics by the translators because there's another legitimate way that we could have translated this. It could have said this, to him who offers praise, he prepares a way that I may show him the salvation of God. He, he prepares, if you would, a way for the manifestation of salvation from the situation, whatever it is you're going through. How many people, when you're going through a rough patch financially, you want to be saved out of that? Or you're in a rough place physically, you want to be saved out of that. And, and there's another, some other beautiful examples, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, uh, and, and, uh, and there's this story about King Jehoshaphat. He was the king of Judah, and he had this vast army that was coming up against him. They were on the march, and they were coming against him from the southeast. And there's something about Jehoshaphat that he knew with his army of Judah. He did not have the manpower. He didn't have the resources to be able to fight what was being arrayed against him. And he knew that he didn't have it, so he did a couple of things. And the first thing was he proclaimed a fast. And he called all of the people of God from Judah to come together and to be together. And as they were praying and as they were fasting, the Lord spoke prophetically through a Levite, through one of the priests, and he told them what to do. He said, you just have to go down. You need to go down to a certain place. You don't have to fight this battle. Everybody say, he didn't have to fight this battle. You don't have to fight this battle. The Lord will fight it for you. And Jehoshaphat he said, believe in the Lord God and his prophets and you will prosper. So what happened? The next day, they set out. And this is what happened. And we're looking at, at chapter 20 and verse 21 of, of Second Chronicles. It said, and when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who would sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and were saying, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endures forever. So you notice, the same reason comes up again. Now when they begin to, to sing and to praise, the Lord began to do something. He began to set up ambushes against the people of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, and the word tells us that they were defeated. They didn't lift a spear, didn't lift a sword, didn't lift a shield. They lifted up something far more powerful, the praise of the Lord. And the Lord went before them. And when they went to the battlefield, all of their enemies were dead. All of their enemies were dead. All they had left to do was to gather the spoils to themselves. Amen? I'll tell you, we're uh, so blessed to have a God that doesn't require us to toil to sweat, to give it our best effort first. All he asks is for the praises of his people. I guess I'll leave you with these last couple of thoughts as we, as we get ready to close here because there's a beautiful story, of course, in the New Testament uh, about Paul and Silas. And uh, Paul and Silas uh, were doing some great ministry and they were getting into a ministry of deliverance and Paul had cast out a demon and, uh, out of a fortune-telling woman. And because of it, the entire city just went into a big uproar. And uh, before things were done, uh, they, uh, they got tossed into jail. Uh, I can't imagine what the actual narrative would have been like uh, back then. Silas was probably saying, 
it was going good, the meetings were going good, did you have to cast a demon out of the fortune teller? Uh, but he was following the Holy Spirit and he, he, he did what he had to do. And in Acts, they were thrown into jail, into, the, into a real pit. But in Acts chapter 16, verse 25, it says, but at midnight, Paul and Silas were doing something. They were praying and singing hymns to God and the prisoners were listening to them. I'll tell you what, they had never heard anybody like that in jail before. Acts 16, 26 said, and then suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's chains were loosed. Church, what released the earthquake? I mean, it was a supernatural earthquake that undid, undid the chains that were on everybody in there. It wasn't just an ordinary type of earthquake. What precipitated that earthquake? Praise. Praise. So the one who offers praise unto the Lord prepares a way for God to show him his salvation. I'll just close with these two thoughts. And we've already chatted about some of them. First, when should we praise the Lord? Always, continually, day, night, forever and ever, at all times. God's word leaves no doubt to that. Second, how do we praise the Lord? Church, we need to do it with a whole heart. Not a half a heart, a half an idea. I'll give it time when I can fit it in. But with a whole heart, with our understanding, with, with our hands uplifted, with joyful mouth, with, a joy, with joyful lips, the lifting of hands, evening sacrifice, morning sacrifice, the sacrifice of praise, especially when we're in the spirit of heaviness. We're to do it with a timbrel and a dance. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Who's to praise God? If you were to take the time, we can't do it now, look at Psalm 148, you'll literally see 20 different, 29 different kinds of people. 29, it's in Psalm 148. Look at that at home. Who are to praise God? And if you're still in doubt, what I just said in Psalm 150, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. But as I close here this morning, there's just one class of people. There's just one class of people who do not praise the Lord. Who might that be? The dead. So you know your problem, don't you? Whatever it is. If you're not praising the Lord, you've got your own diagnosis. You're not physically dead but you might be spiritually dead. And today, we have an opportunity on this Palm Praise Sunday to make choice to praise the Lord with all of our hearts. Let's stand as we close in prayer today. Have you been challenged by the word today? Three amens. I'm really thankful for that. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. How many people here are breathing? How many are not? How many aren't sure? If you're here today, why don't we just take a few moments and praise the Lord with our lips, the tongue that he gave us. Go ahead, say it out loud. It won't bite unless you bite your tongue. Hallelujah, Lord. We praise you. We give you glory. Hallelujah, Lord. You're good. Praise you, Lord. We praise you, Lord God. You're good. I thank you, Lord God. You give us beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. We worship you and we praise your holy name. You're good. And while I was still a sinner, you sent Christ Jesus to die for me. I thank you, Lord God. I thank you that I'm blessed in the city and blessed in the field. Father, I praise your name. I praise your name. Glory to you, Lord. Glory to you, Lord God. We praise you. Thank you, Jesus. Give you all the glory, all the honor. Go ahead, church. Worship him. <coughs> Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord Jesus. 
Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Even the rocks will cry out if we don't. Hallelujah, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Glory, glory. Go ahead. We're going to do it till you get the hang of it. Thank you, Lord. Aren't going home till we all do it. Glory to God. Hallelujah, Lord. Oh, you're amazing. In my sadness, in my despair, in my mourning, you are there. I thank you that you never left me. You never left me at all. You stayed and you comforted me and you led me be beside the still waters. Thank you, Jesus. We give you all the glory. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, glory to God. Father, we just thank you and praise you. Father, we thank you. We will not be outpraised by rocks. I thank you, Lord, in our going in and our coming out that the name of the Lord shall be praised. Father, I thank you when bad thoughts come our way. Father, when despair comes our way, if depression is visiting our doors, Father, we open up our mouths and we praise you. We may not feel like it, but we praise you. It's the weapon that you've given that defeats the enemy in our lives, whatever the enemy is. The financial mountain, the health mountain. We praise you, Lord. You are good. The loss that we've experienced, yeah, it hurt, but you are good. I praise your name. And I'm standing today, Lord, not because of my strength, but because of Christ in me, the hope of glory. I thank you, Lord Jesus. I thank you, Lord Jesus. You always lead us in triumphal procession. We give you all the glory. Father, I thank you for your church here and around the world. Father, I thank you, Lord, that your church, the body of Christ, will rise up, will praise your name, and then great things will happen. Too many things have been risen up. Too many words have been spoken that have not been praised. Too many things have been spoken about other people, about the government, about the situation, about the culture. Father, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Father, we choose to use our tongues to give you praise, to bring you glory. We thank you for it. I thank you, Lord God, for this week ahead. I thank you that throughout the week, all of us have breath. We'll praise you, Lord. We give you all the glory, all the honor. In Jesus' mighty name. And if you believe it, why don't we shout amen. Amen, amen. and amen to the glory of God. God bless you. We love you. And we'll see you out in the lobby for some cookies and coffee and stuff. And we'll see you next week. Hey, church, if you didn't grab one on the way in, those invitations for Passion Week aren't for you. You're here. They're so that you'll invite somebody. Why not give somebody an opportunity to experience life? Take one of them from the Welcome Center when you leave. Invite one person at the coffee shop, at the store. Please, let's give them heaven. See you out there.